there's been a relatively newer indie title getting a lot of attention recently. A cooperative horror game with comedic elements. Since you've seen the title, you know I'm talking about Lethal Company. It's a game many people, myself included, enjoy with friends, and I've had my fair share of fun experiences within the game. But one other striking aspect about its identity is its visual style. Its materials are something akin to cell shading, and the models are generally lower in their polygon count. A polygon being a plane with at least three straight sides and angles, and typically five or more. Most games will specifically use quads, or a polygon consisting of four sides. But if we pull the character model from Lethal Company, we can see the distribution of polygonal faces is spaced in a really impractical way and almost entirely consists of tries, or a polygon with three sides. Technical standards aside, the look gives the game a stylistic charm, but I can't help but wonder what the game would feel like had its models had a more realistic touch, more specifically the main player character. And so, that's the goal I'm here to achieve. Let's get into it. Whenever creating a new 3D model, the initial step is to collect a reference. Anything about the smaller aspects or even the big picture silhouette. Anything helps to try and get a more cohesive, final outcome. So when looking at the player model for Lethal Company, my initial thought was that it must be a hazmat suit. But the issue is there is a hazmat suit in Lethal Company. It's yellow, and not orange like the default one. So my next thought was that it must be something more cloth-like. Specifically, I was thinking of something like the Vault Suit from Fallout New Vegas. That one's more like a big set of pajamas more than anything. And then I found out that Lethal Company also has a pajama suit. So it must be somewhere in between. At least that's my assumption. And that's when I came across these pictures of Japanese firefighters. Now the fact they're orange helps, but it looks like a relatively good fit for what we're going for. After all, the original model kind of leaves a lot up to interpretation, so we're allowed to get experimental with this one. And so, with a collection of references to guide my way, I could begin. The first step to begin with was creating a base mesh, in this case a humanoid one, on account of the fact that the player is humanoid. Now this would be created using a series of subdivided cubes, subdivision essentially being a more mathematical way of smoothing out and adding more polygons to a shape. It'll turn a cube into a sphere, and a more complex shape into a slightly better looking complex shape. Now I can upload the full recording somewhere if people want me to, but this is largely meant to be a summarized version of the process. Most of this initial base mesh is just produced using these subdivided shapes, and we can get most of the detail for the basic block out achieved this way. That being said, there are some details that do need more specific attention. If you look at the front of the suit, you'll see there's zippers that just aren't attached to anything, there's no slit to denote a pocket, it's just floating there, on the front of the suit. The reason being, it would actually be somewhat impractical to include this in the base geometry. This is something that I'll touch on later, but for now, just keep in mind that this is going to have more detail applied in a different way. Things like the air tank on the back of the character are modeled in a much more direct way than the base body, Rather than extruding a bunch of subdivided shapes to try and create an approximate form of a person, this is more getting primitive shapes and piecing them together more closely. There's a bit more to this, but that's the essential gist. It's a lot more straightforward hard surface modelling as opposed to the suit which is debatably more soft surface or organic modelling despite the fact it's not flesh. This more just denotes the type of surfaces that you're working with when you're modelling. Things like vehicles and weapons are more hard surface, they're directly mechanical and rough in their edges. While organic modelling is things like characters and creatures and, you know, cloth and things that are more... freeform in the shape that they take. A part that was surprisingly odd to try and work out was the harness around the character. Besides the fact that I hadn't anticipated it covering the name tag on the suit, it was also just very hard to try and work it onto the character's body. The way this is achieved is through a shrink wrap modifier with some adjustments. Shrink wrapping essentially being the process of wrapping a mesh around another mesh, like getting a plastic bag and vacuum sealing it over a cube. You would be shrink wrapping it. The issue with this is the approximation of how close the mesh is, and the differences in uh, polygons between the actual harness and the main character means that sometimes there's a bit of clipping and just complications in general that require a lot of 
closer detail adjustments. But by the end, I was able to have a passable harness that was covering the character and the air tanks on the back without any noticeable clipping or complication. If you look at the original Lethal Company model, it's actually hard to figure out how it's attached to the character. There's no fastenings on the actual model, and it doesn't seem like there's any way it's been strapped on. That being said, the harness and the way it shines in screenshots makes me think it's leather. This is also attributed to the fact that it hangs around the character in a less secure way. It looks like it's been ramshackled on, which is fitting for the scrapyard aesthetic of these characters. And so I began to model buckles for these harnesses to make it appear more like a leather strap along with a little flap at the back so it's, you know, locked in. The final much more complex piece of this block out was the actual helmet of the character itself. In the context of the game and other players, it acts more as the character's face than an actual helmet. It's their identity. So it needs to be important that we keep true to the original shape. Despite the fact this would generally be classed as a hard surface model and is in this context, I've used a lot of subdivided shapes to try and get to this point, which is pretty expected, it's not out of the question for hard surface modeling, but in this case I've used a lot more of what's called edge creasing on these models to try and get a more hard surface edge. What edge creasing is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's creasing the edge, it's pinching it in, and pulling it closer to its original edge point. If you had a cube, and you subdivided it, you would end up with what looks like a sphere. But if you edge crease every single edge to its maximum intensity, you would have that model returned back to its cube despite being subdivided. It would still keep its increased polygonal count, but it wouldn't have any of that edge smoothing that's characterized by subdivision. Looking for references for this helmet was actually kind of hard because of how specific the design is. And you may be thinking it's just a gas mask, it's a helmet, sure. But it's got this weird cube shape that isn't quite an aspect of poor modeling, it is actually the design. It's like a cylinder head, it's like a Ned Kelly kind of bucket head. But my initial thoughts went to things like welding masks and diving helmets. And these had all right aspects, but I actually stumbled upon this one image of the Doom Guy helmet that I really liked, and I thought I could adapt it fairly well to this kind of model. And so, after a lot of finagling with the helmet, I was able to get a shape I was actually pretty happy with. It seemed pretty loyal to the original vision of the character, but also did look more cohesive, more like an actual helmet in the way it's fitted to the character's head. And now we have a finished block out model, and it looks pretty good I'd say. The only thing is, it's not done. This is the block out, we need to move on to more detailed aspects. Now getting into these higher detail aspects of the model would be impractical to do in Blender, which is what we've been using so far. It would not run well because of Blender's tentacle limitations, and ultimately the tools aren't fully realized here. We'll need to move into a different program for some of this, specifically ZBrush. ZBrush is a program specifically made for 3D sculpting, digital sculpting, it's more organic in the general workflow. That being said, it does offer options for more traditional modeling techniques, but it's a contentious subject, it's not very well refined in ZBrush, and that's why we jump between Blender for these two different types of things. This is part of the pipeline, or the workflow. This is the process from getting to point A to point B, we've got to jump between these things so we can come with our final outcome. I slightly subdivided the model more than what was seen before, just so we have more polygons to work with when we're sculpting in ZBrush. We're limited by what we have to work with, so it's important that we have more to work with. What I'm doing in this program is adding more specific details like wrinkles in the cloth and things like the stitching, and this is also where, if you'll remember from earlier, the zipper will finally get its slit. Now we have pockets. Fantastic. This is also where I'll be adding some details into the leather harness from earlier. I'll be putting things like little holes for the buckles to fit into, as well as the lining on the edges just to make it look like it's been stitched in like actual leather craftsmanship. It's important in this part to use the references as best you can. Looking at my references for the jumpsuit was the only way I was able to really get some alright looking wrinkles in. Cloth wrinkles are quite hard to model given the fact there's something that's directly affected by physics, and you have to try and replicate that. 
There's different ways to sculpt these wrinkles, whether it be following references directly or using things like the XYZ method in which you literally draw in the letters X, Y, and Z with a more loose form, and it comes out kind of looking like wrinkles. I used a mix of these, but for the most part I'm pretty happy with the outcome. After doing all this, I had to go back and just do some more detail working. I tried to finagle with the boots on the character, but didn't quite work the way I wanted to. Eventually I just went back and decided I would do it in the texture and I would just sculpt in some wrinkles on it and that would do it for the moment. And now onto ultimate tedium, UV unwrapping. UV mapping is the process of unwrapping a model's geometry onto a 2D surface. The U and the V denote each axis on this 2D plane that the surface is now being projected onto. Take for example a cube. If you wanted to make a seam in one edge and cut it open and unwrap it into a net, you would have this shape. This would effectively be considered a UV unwrapping if you were to texture it. In the same way for our model, we would be marking out the seams of the model to denote where it would cut itself open and flatten itself onto our plane. When we do this back in Blender, we're left with our UV maps. And doing this for every single part of the model is extremely time consuming, it's one of the more tedious tasks in 3D modeling. But by the time we're done, we have our UV maps and using in Blender functions we can automatically arrange them and shape them so that they all fit together nicely. That way we're not manually placing them all out to try and find the optimal layout of these UVs. I have plugins for this that make this much easier, such as UV Packmaster Pro, but the default Blender UV Packer can work just as well, albeit with a lot more manual adjustment. You might actually notice that I'm not UV unwrapping the higher detail sculpted model that I created in ZBrush. Instead I'm UV unwrapping the original block out that we created in Blender. The reason being that this higher detail model isn't used as the actual model, it is for something called baking. And before we can get onto that, we'll need to move on to our next program, Substance Painter, our next piece in the pipeline. As it might sound, this is a program dedicated to painting, specifically texture painting. While Blender does have features for texturing, they're just far more primitive compared to Substance Painter Suite, which is built entirely for texturing. It's a key industry program. I've exported the original block out model and the high detail models into separate parts. Every single piece of it is separated and named with the suffix underscore low or underscore high. This obviously tells you which one is higher detail and which one is lower detail, and Substance Painter can detect this and use it when it's baking in the details. The way these details are projected from the higher detail model onto the lower detail model is through the use of special types of textures to achieve specific effects. Let's go through these. There is the initial diffuse or albedo texture. These terms used to have different meanings but are more so interchangeable nowadays when referring to them in this context. This texture is the base colors, there's no other lighting or effects, it is just the solid color that goes onto the character. Next up is the roughness map. This is a black and white texture with the black portions meaning that is more slippery or shiny, while the white parts of the texture have more of a matte finish, they're generally less shiny. There are also metallic textures, which essentially follow the same rules, except black means it's not metallic and white means it is. And the normal map, also known as a displacement or bump map depending on the context of where you're using it. Sometimes this can be different, but for the most part these all mean the same thing. This is what a normal map looks like. Each color in this texture denotes a different direction that it's supposed to be aiming. When it all comes together it looks quite striking. It's with this texture that programs and game engines can figure out how the light should affect it based on these rules. Strange as it may seem, this gives the illusion of detail. After all, the way anything is detailed is by the way the light bounces off of it. So on a lower detail model that has a higher detail texture bump map on it, we're none the wiser. There's some differences in the silhouette and some of the shapes, but overall it's a pretty loyal adaptation from the higher detail model to the lower one. A final and more Substance Painter specific one is the curvature maps. This is literally a texture that just denotes the curvature of the model. The wider parts are more harsh edges while the blacker parts are more smoothed out. 
It's this that we can use to use some little bit of finer detail tweaking later, but it's not really important here. After baking the high detail model onto the textures of the low detail model, we now have what is known as a texture set. Now, notably this doesn't contain the roughness or the metallic. These are different aspects of the textures, but I needed to mention them here. The star player when we're adapting the higher detail model to the lower one is the normal maps. This is what gives it the higher detail. This is what we need. And now that we have it, we can begin working on the actual colors and the textures of it. Starting off, we just give the jumpsuit a basic orange color. This is what is the color of the suit, but it looks bland. So what I do is I put a different texture on top of it and put a mask. That way only specific portions of it appear through the model and I can change the height and roughness of it to give it the illusion of the depth of fabric. Next up I just wanted to get the patches out of the way. Now in the actual game, the characters have three different patches. They have one that shows what I can only assume is the logo of the lethal company in question, a name tag denoting whether they are a VIP or not, which may or may not be present depending on who is the VIP, and a ranking patch which shows what rank the person is. In this case I wanted to go with the intern since it's the starting level and the most well known. Now since I based this patch on the Japanese firefighters, the spacing isn't that great and that's honestly just on me but I think I can make it work. I'll have to rearrange the actual placement of these patches, but for a visual design, it's not the worst. To look at my references and basically remake these patches, I went through the references I had of the actual in-game screenshots of the character and tried to remake them in Paint.net. Paint.net's a free program, and it's probably not as good as Photoshop, I would have to assume, but I'm quicker in this one, so that's just on me. Eventually I got what I think looks pretty good and I imported it back into Substance Painter so I could imprint it onto the model's texture. Substance Painter gives you access to specific brushes that have different types of effects. There's a normal standard circular brush, but it also gives you options for different types of brushes like dirt or paint or in this case stitching. And so using one of the stitching brushes that comes with Substance Painter, I was able to paint a little edge around the patches to give it more of a patched on feel. A lot of it was similar finagling, with putting black cloth on the gloves and putting more rubberized materials on things like the boots. On top of the brushes and materials and textures they give you, Substance Painter also has tools. These are like brushes but have more specific use cases. There's things like screws and oil leaks and fur, but in this case I'm looking for the zipper. As you can probably guess, I'm putting this where the zipper parts would be, the pocket, the middle zipper line for the suit itself. And these look pretty good, they don't have a lot of detail from this close, but you can get the gist of what they're meant to mean. And they generally just save us some time. Onto the boots of the character, this was something I was a bit worried about since I tried to do this in the actual model, but it just didn't seem like it would work in any practical way. Not without it being a very unoptimized looking model, and that's honestly probably just an effect on my part. But I was actually pretty happy with the end results for this texture. I used a lot of different height displacement, which is something you can adjust per texture in Substance Painter, for each layer. And I was using all these layers so I can make what looks like the flaps of the boots, along with the laces and the buttons and everything that comes with it. This is honestly not the most practical way to go about this, but it does make it more optimized in the fact that there's less geometry to work with in this circumstance. Going onto the helmet for this model was actually quite fun. Looking at my references, there are a lot of little details I could put in to make it really pop. You might also notice there's a lot of details that don't have specific use or seem a little unnecessary like all these little ridges. Now obviously these could be things like welding points and places where the actual segments of this manufactured helmet would be connected, but the point is these are little details that don't have any immediate meaning. According to Collins Dictionary, greebling is a type of cosmetic detailing added to the surface of an object to make it appear more complex or technologically advanced. It's something that originated on things like film sets and toys. You see it a lot in Star Wars as well with all the ships. It's essentially the process of adding little uh, miscellaneous details to make it seem more advanced. In the same way here we're adding a lot of little compartments and spaces and it doesn't really have any specific use but you can infer it you can see it doesn't look wrong it just looks sci-fi but outside of that that was essentially most of the details outside of weathering and other surface effects for the helmet 
When I went on to texture the harness, I was able to use a lot of Substance Painter's pre-packed leather textures, specifically for things like the height and surface imperfections. And after that I could use the stitching brush again, just like I used on the patches, but this time it was a more square thicker one, something you would see on belt buckling. And I just used that to cover the edges as well as put little holes just to make it more of a belt. The air tank was actually surprisingly easy, whether that be a virtue of how easy this program is to use or unseen laziness, but I was able to use some of the pre-packed smart materials that are in Substance Painter. These are materials that use the previously baked texture sets to generate the surface of the smart material. It's a lot less customizable than, say, trying to build your own material setup using the other options, but for a quick and easy out, it's a pretty good choice. And I just use one of the metal smart materials to cover it up, and then use some other layers to put color in and just make it fit closer to the original reference model. And so, we're able to export it out of Substance Painter and import it back through Blender in the material nodes. Nodes are the main way that Blender and a lot of other programs handle materials, and it's just a basic inputting of specific nodes into the main principled shader node, which is the default shader setup that Blender has, which is compatible with what we have set up now. It's a physically based rendering setup. This essentially is what is using our other previously mentioned textures, like our base, our roughness, metallic, normal maps, these things all come together to create a physically based rendering. The lighting is more realistic and it overall just looks good. This is the standard for games in the modern era. This isn't counting more stylized or cartoonish products, which will generally use a NPR rendering setup or a non-physically based rendering setup, which is another whole subsect of this kind of idea. After setting up some lighting and getting a good look at the model, I wanted to go back into Substance Painter and just give it a little bit more weathering, just so it can have a bit more worn detail to it. It looked too pristine in the way I'd left it, so I wanted to give it some, some damage. I think it came out looking quite nice, and now I've got to the final step. We've got our model, and we can see what it would look like, but it doesn't move. It's not pose, it's in a T pose. And we could leave it that way, but it's just not really ideal. I want it to look, you know, I want it to move. And so begins the process of rigging. I didn't need to go with a crazy complex rig, I decided to use the default humanoid rig heavily adjusted from the Blender Rigify add-on. This is one of the default add-ons that comes in Blender that you can enable and it'll just give you a lot more rigging options and some preset rig skeletons that you can use. The skeleton being what the characters can use once they're assigned to them so that they can move using the joints on that skeleton. And that means we have to assign each section of the model to each bone. This is done using vertex groups, which are essentially weighted areas on the model, with a red being a higher intensity weight and blue being the least. And using this we can just paint on different areas in a term called weight painting to mark where on the rig it would be moving per bone. And depending on who you ask, this is a bit tedious of a process, but by the end we have a basic rig and we can pose our character. And here they are, the Lethal Company Crewmate. I actually had a lot of fun with this format, so if anyone else has anything else they want me to do in this format, go ahead and give it a shout, because this is pretty fun, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm not sure if I would do anything else from Lethal Company specifically, partly because I don't want to just do a redo, and also because the other models in the game are a lot less straightforward, or at least they wouldn't be as interesting to me. But either way, I had a lot of fun putting it together and editing all this, so uh, thanks for watching if you came all the way through at the end. See you around.